When you look in your own mirrors at home, what stares back at you? As we reflect on those questions today, let us begin with a word of prayer. God of grace and mercy, this day we pray that you would open our ears, that we might hear your word afresh and anew, and open our hearts, that we might love you in deeper and deeper ways. And God, in all things, may we reflect your love as it has been set before us in the example of Jesus Christ. Amen. So how many people here are Harry Potter fans? All right, I think this is actually the highest concentration in any of the services today, which is exactly the opposite of my expectation. Well, the first Harry Potter book came out 16 years ago, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. The first movie came out 14 years ago. And the first book, the first movie, focused on a young Harry Potter learning about his abilities as a wizard. You're a wizard, Harry, starts the the movie. He goes off to a school where he meets a few new friends and they go on a quest to find this powerful magic item. Well, in the middle of the movie, Harry gets this invisibility cloak and he uses it to sneak around school at night. And as he looks, he stumbles upon a mirror. And, well, let's just take a look at what happens when he finds that mirror. If you didn't catch it, as Harry was walking up to the mirror, there's an inscription that sits around the edge of the surface. The inscription reads, Erised stra eru oits ube kafru oits on wosi. Can you all repeat that? (laughs) It's not another language. In fact, if you were to hold a mirror to that image, to those words, You could read it backwards, and it would say, I show not your face, but your heart's desire. The mirror that Harry looks into is called the mirror of Erised, the mirror of desire. In the book, in the movie, it's a mirror that shows your innermost desire. And young Harry is an orphan. Without his mother and father, his heart's desire is to see his family united again. Later, Harry would bring his friend Ron in front of the mirror, and as Ron stood in front of it, he would see himself as the most popular boy in school. Everyone would love him. 
Now, if I were to stand in front of the mirror of Erised, I would be the captain of a cross-country team, the fastest guy out there. And of course, as the fastest guy out there, I'd also have to have the fastest car, a Mustang Shelby GT500. <laughs> Ivy's car seat wouldn't go in that one. Well, what I have up here today is not the mirror of Erised, not the mirror of desire. In fact, this is a mirror that I had somebody go and borrow from the women's room in the office. Much to the chagrin of a couple people that needed to finish getting ready this morning. They walked by my office, ran in and said, why do you have the mirror? How did you get it? Well, we turn and look to mirrors when we want to get a better look at ourselves. That's when we stand in front of the mirror. Really, we don't need to turn to a mirror at any other point in the day. We only look at the mirror when we're trying to get ready or straighten ourselves up, when we want to make sure our tie is on straight or that we haven't missed a spot shaving if you were one to shave. It's a way to focus on ourselves. It's a way to look at who we are. You see, we don't have difficulty looking at our friends our family, and our loved ones. But we do have difficulty seeing ourselves. Now think about it this way. You have never seen your face without the use of some reflective device or a camera that has taken your picture. We are physically incapable of looking at our face from within our own skull. When we look into the mirror, it is because we want to focus on ourselves. The mirror on a physical level shows an individual focus. It's also a reflection of a spiritual problem. Our ego drives us to focus on ourselves. We seek our own ambition, our own goals. Throughout our lives, society again and again and again has taught us that there is only so much to go around. It's the model and the idea of scarcity. There's only so much to go around and there's not enough for everybody. So I have to focus on myself and do everything I can to make sure I am cared for, even if that means stepping over somebody else. This is the problem that Paul begins to address in his letter to the Philippians. Now Paul starts off his letter to the Philippians praising them and rejoicing with them because they had done some great and wonderful things. They had grown in wonderful and new ways and God was working in that community. But Paul saw a problem the begun to break his heart for this community that he loved so dearly, that he held in such high regard. Indeed, the Philippian church was one of Paul's favorite churches. But he sees something that needs to be addressed. And so the second chapter starts out with the following phrase, if then... There is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy. Make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. You see, in Philippi, Small quarrels and squabbles were beginning to arise. Paul had learned this from others that had relayed the news to him, that shared with him that there were petty jealousies and fighting over honors and rewards. So Paul's chief motive in this letter is to warn his friends Warn the church that he loves against error, errors that at first just seem trivial. 
but if left unchecked, can have the gravest of consequences. When we look into the mirror, we look inward to ourselves. We place our ambition in front of everything else as the prime focus. However, Paul offers us a different path. He offers us a different option when he says, if there is any encouragement in Christ. Danny's translation might read, if there is any support in Christ or anyone you might call to your side, call them and together be unified with Christ. But what does it mean to be unified together, to be of the same mind? Paul offers in Philippians 2, 1 through 11, one of his first efforts to define the essential mark of all who call themselves Christians. Do nothing from, selfish, from selfishness or conceit. Look to the larger good, leaving yourself out of account. Paul begs his readers to follow the example of Christ and live a humble life. The unifying mark of a Christian is is humility. Now most of Philippians is a very personal letter. It's devoid of some of Paul's finer, more eloquent speeches, some of his more grammatically sound and structured writings. Much of it is the same, much of it is written in the same way that you would write to one of your friends. Hey, how's it going? It's been a while since I've seen or heard from you. You're not really going to focus too much on making sure who and whom is correct. But in verses 5 through 11, Paul changes his writing style. Here, the grammar is sharp. The language is succinct and precise. And if you read it in the original Greek, it comes across almost like a song. So in these six verses, Paul changes his writing, and he does it in a way to say, pay attention to these words, because they are important. If you forget everything else in this letter, pay attention to these words. These words that call us to a life of humility, that remind us that God lowered God's self to the form of a human Now, that level of humility is often lost. I mean, God, the creator of everything that lives and breathes and moves, took on flesh and bone, became human, but didn't stop there, took it a step farther and became a servant to all. Look to the story of the Last Supper. You see, Jesus dining with his friends when he gets up and proceeds to wash the feet of every one of his disciples. Even Peter, who would deny him three times. Even Judas, who would betray him. Here, we have the example of true humility. One who is above all, becoming the servant of all. And so in these few verses, Paul reminds us this is the example of humility that each and every one of us should aspire to. Now, in the announcements, Justin mentioned that we are in the middle of a sermon series called Not My Own. We've been walking line by line through John Wesley's covenant prayer. And as I looked through the prayer this week and looked at this week's line... This week's line is, I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. This week is the first week that the line is different than the other lines. Up until this point, the focus has been on me and my. Even as we're praying to God, not my will but thine, each line Put me to what thou wilt, 
put me to doing. Let me be employed. Let me be full. Me again and again. This is the first line in Wesley's prayer that does not have me or my. The move is from self to God. From me to thy. Instead of aspiring to a higher status and focusing on the self, we are called to empty ourselves. As Christ emptied himself, when we begin to choose not to seek our own reward but to serve, the image of the mirror begins to be removed and we're able to move into a cruciform life. Looking to the example of Jesus. When we look into the mirror, no longer do we see ourselves, but we see Christ reflected in our image. What's more, as we live into this cruciform life, this life of humility and self-sacrifice, we begin to be drawn together. Each and every one of us becomes the body of Christ. All of us together reflect the very nature of God in humility, in love, and in mercy. So what? I'm called to live a humble life. How do I do that? What does it look like? Well, we can look to examples through history and through our modern context, to see individuals who we could look to and say, that, that person truly is humble. In our modern society, we could look to Pope Francis. He put aside some of the more extravagant papal privileges that some of his predecessors wore. He got rid of the red Prada shoes, and don simple vestments. He turned aside invitations from the powerful, choosing instead to dine with the homeless, to care for the marginalized. There are even rumors that at the beginning of his time in office as Pope, he would sneak out at night to go to the edges of Vatican City and minister to the poor. So we can look to Francis as an example of what humility can look like. But at the same time, that example can be disheartening because each and every one of us can say, well, that's great that the Pope did that. But there's no chance that I can get to that level. Well, there's another great of the church, another servant, humble in spirit, Mother Teresa once said, if you can't feed 100, then feed just one. Each of us can humbly serve in our own ways. And there are a myriad of opportunities for us to humbly serve in the kingdom. If you can't feed 100, but just one, perhaps you could work in open arms where we feed close to 200 every Sunday. If you weren't here last Sunday, we had our missions celebration, lifting up the different missions partners we have in the church. You can grab one of the yellow books and the information racks on your way out and look and find a different way to plug yourself in to missions. If you want to serve here on campus, the tech team would love to have you. Or you can serve in hospitality, making sure that everyone who steps foot on this campus is greeted warmly from the street to their seat and back. That they feel God's grace in your warm and loving welcome. These are just a few ways that you can serve. Begin to set aside your own pride and ambition to offer others love. 
If you're interested in finding a new way to serve, I'd invite you to take that connection card that Justin lifted up at the start of the service, turn it over onto the back and say, I'd love to serve in tech. I'd love to serve in hospitality. Tell me more about missions and we'll get in contact with you. As Christ freely yielded himself to the will of God, let us, each and every one of us, freely and heartily yield all things to God's pleasure and disposal, offering ourselves in humility and sacrifice. When we look into the mirror, we see only ourselves. We've never truly seen our face. That's because we have been designed to always be looking outward to our brothers and sisters, humbly serving them and humbly serving God. So friends, let us pray together, seeking to reflect Christ and Christ's humility in all that we do. Let us join together as we have the last few weeks praying Wesley's covenant prayer the words to which will be on the screen in front of you. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for thee, or laid aside for thee. Melted for thee, or brought low for thee. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine and I am thine. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. With all humility and thanksgiving, let us turn to God offering our tithes and our gifts.